What is up YouTube fam, Robbie C here today. We are at Bessie Essel Park, one of my best kept secrets in the city of Birmingham. And we are going to be talking about not the most reliable shot in the game, which you guys have heard. And if you've ever watched the channel before, you know, most reliable shot in disc golf is a fill in the blank, almost like a door of the Explorer moment. Like what is it boots? What is it going to be? It's a hyzer. A hyzer is definitely the most reliable shot in disc golf. But today we're going to talk about the antithesis of that, the opposite of that, the most unreliable. No, actually, I do think it's pretty reliable. Feeling like I'm in a pretty silly, goofy mood filming this video. So should be a fun time for Silas and hopefully a more fun time for you guys watching this. Let's dive into Anheuser approaches. I'm going to go zone OS first. So catch me. Whoa, 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 whoa. Toll. Don't, don't get him with that catch me with you fall before you, you know, thing, Silas. You gotta ask. Gotta ask. Josiah, how you doing today? You having a good one? So catch me if I fall. So what do we mean by Anheuser approaches being unreliable, Heiser approaches being reliable? Like what kind of noise am I putting down with that? So let's talk about first, Heiser approaches. So a Heiser approach, for those of you who may be very new and you're catching this video or this is one of the first videos you're coming across, Heiser is where no matter which hand you're holding it, no matter which way you're holding it, a Heiser is when the outside edge of the disc is pointed down. That allows it to go in that crescent moon shape, that arc, that for a lot of you when you're first getting into disc golf, most of your shots are gonna feel like hyzers that are coming out. For right-handed players, everything's gonna come out to the right and then get back to the left very fast. When we throw shots, trying to throw them flat means that I can put a little too much anhyzer, which is where that outside edge goes up, and I can get it moving a little too much this way, I can put it a little too much this way, and then I also, not only do I have to worry about the shape that it's going on, but I have to worry about one of the most important parts of disc golf, the distance. But when I throw hyzers, if I'm throwing hyzers with a reliable overstable disc, I can put it on this shape and I know that it's going to go out right and come back left. Or if I'm lefty throwing a backhand, it's going to start out left and come back right. However that may be, it's going to follow that hyzer shape. And so then I don't have to worry about necessarily the shot shape. All I have to worry about is the distance. Boom, right next to the basket. The beautiful part about hyzers is that I can grab a host of discs and try to throw them all to the basket. These are all four different discs, five different discs, and bada boom, bada bing. The hyzer gets all of them incredibly close, but that is a shot that while I think is very helpful and important and you should look at several times while you're doing this, what happens, let's say, when you're pinched off as a right-handed player and there's a tree in your way and you don't really have the hyzer approach? Well, you can go with the forehand hyzer approach on the other side, but there are times that I think a shot or an approach that a lot of people are overlooking is the Anheuser approach. The Anheuser approach is a really fun tool that you can use to not only give yourself a chance at getting close to the basket, but based on how the Anheuser flight works, you actually may have the opportunity to be a little more aggressive and run at the basket and maybe throw it in from distance while still not leaving yourself too far of a putt afterwards. What do we mean by Anheuser putt? Let's talk about the terms. I love getting to go out and play with new players. And a couple weekends ago, we were up in Asheville, North Carolina, technically like Banner Elk. North Carolina. We were there for a bachelor party for a friend that's about to get married. And on the property, they actually had a little 18 hole pitch and putt disc golf course. So I took a couple of the groomsmen out. I'd brought a couple of discs with me. They were in the car and we played. And something that I had to explain to them was when trying to first understand how the disc flies. And we were talking about Anheuser versus Heiser approaches. So I wanna explain this in a way that when you're throwing a disc, yes, the way that you throw it, your arm speed, your ability to input spin and power into the disc is going to affect how the disc flies. But one of the major ways that we can have influence on a disc and one of the major ways that people can create easier distance is understanding that there are two natural forces happening to a shot 
every single time they are thrown, regardless of who is throwing them or how much arm power, arm speed, spin they're putting into the disc. The first is understanding what the disc naturally wants to do. If you're new to disc golf, you may be asking, why do people have like a whole bag of discs? Wouldn't one Frisbee be enough? Well, that's a great question. And the discs naturally want to do different things. For a great example, for example, I have these three fairway drivers that all have a similar feel in their hand. And on a first glance, they all have these bladed rims as well. And you may think, okay, well, these all do the same thing. But when thrown flat with the right amount of spin and power, this disc as a right-handed player wants to go pretty far left as a felon. This disc when thrown as a right-handed player goes pretty straight and might have a little bit of finish to the left. And this disc, when thrown flat, is going to actually move to the right on its own. Three discs thrown by the same person can, can, can achieve three different flights. So when we understand that every disc naturally wants to go a certain way, we can then manipulate how we're throwing the shot because the second factor is that how you throw the shot determines the spin of the shot and where it wants to go naturally as well. For instance, as a right-handed player, when I throw a backhand or I throw this way, I am putting spin on the disc that naturally makes it want to go left. So if I throw an overstable disc that also wants to go left, you can guess it's gonna go really far left. But if I throw an understable disc that naturally wants to go right for a right-handed player and I throw it on a backhand with some hyzer making it really wanna go left, it's going to cause this internal fight within the disc of I wanna go this way, but you threw me in a way that wants to go that way. And therefore, it's going to usually fly more straight. Now, Robbie, why are you diving into like a whole discussion of flights and things like that? Hyzers make a lot of sense naturally on why we want to throw those. But Anheuser's can do quite the opposite. And I wanted to get this sort of ground basis for Anheuser's and how we manipulate the flight of a disc because on an Anheuser approach, that is exactly what we're trying to do. We are trying to create an internal battle within the disc to cause it to be a little more controllable and a little straighter, which can cause us to get more aggressive when we're throwing up shots and shots of that nature. So remember how I said for a right-handed player, when I throw on a backhand, which looks like this, I'm putting spin on natural spin on the disc that makes it wanna go left. Now, if I throw a forehand, which is to come through and throw almost like I'm hitting a like sidearm tennis shot, I don't know what it's called, uh, forehand tennis shot. When I'm throwing this way, the spin that I'm putting on the disc is the exact opposite. So that means that as a right-handed player, it's naturally going to want to go right. Now, when I throw a disc on hyzer, it leans into whatever shot or spin I'm throwing it on more naturally. And hyzer against the machine wants to go against that shot pattern, wants to go against that. So if I take a disc and I throw it on Anheuser, but I'm throwing a forehand, that means I'm throwing it on an angle that makes it want to go left, but natural spin, because I'm a right-handed forehand player, makes it want to go right. That internal battle should give it a nice straighter approach to hover right over the basket. Now, the cool thing there is you saw what the beauty of the Anheuser approach is. It's going to fall into that a natural Anheuser shape at first, and it's be moving in one direction, but the spin, because you threw it soft enough, is eventually the natural spin is gonna take over and cause it to fight back. That was with a pig. We can do it with a more beaten pig that's gonna have less fight, as you can see, and it still lands to flat. I throw this watt. I got a pole cat. That's a great example. We'll talk about that in a second. And then a Berg. All five discs that have different purposes, different flights, but on this Anheuser approach, they can be very beautiful. So let's talk about how to throw the Anheuser approach, how to practice it, what discs you may use. This will all wrap around what opportunities you can use it in. So you can approach this from two different angles. You can approach it from the forehand, which I think is the easier of the two to get this shot dialed in because we're not necessarily trying to use this for super long distance shots. We're just using it on touch up shots and things like that. But if you don't have an established forehand, I can understand how this would be difficult. So we can also throw it on backhands. The key to an Anheuser is committing to the follow through. 
a lot of times what's going to happen when people throw these anhyzers is they're going to release back here because they don't want to burn it into the ground they don't want to throw it into the ground so they end up releasing back here and not finishing the shot and finishing out in front of them and therefore it's going to pop out super nose up and not with enough spin and it's going to fight out early so you want to think about committing to throw in front of you and draw the backslash. Finish in front of you and draw the backslash. This works on forehand as well. A lot of people are gonna like release it back here and it doesn't go as well. The forehand is a little easier to chop it down because finishing out in front of you, this feels super odd to throw it so high up here. So they're gonna finish right here, which will chop it into the ground. Your body doesn't really ever wanna throw shots into the ground. So if we aren't intentional about thinking about the follow through or the last half of the shot, your body will naturally help you do what you don't want it to do, which is throw it into the ground. The key to this is that on approaches, you wanna see the disc move from this sharp angle to flat. That's really all we're trying to ask out of it, is that as it comes through the air, it then lands flat. On this curving path, it can come in contact with the basket, which is really helpful. But most of the time, why we want it to land flat is because if it comes in on too hard of an angle, it's gonna cut roll and go very far away from the basket. And the same opportunity can happen if it fights out all the way and doesn't get to flat. We want it to be finishing flat. If it finishes out too early, we have the roll away potential as well. Anytime we're causing a disc to land on its edge like this, outside of throwing extremely high spike hyzers, where the impact into the ground is going to be so hard that it's going to bounce and kind of flop over, we want to make sure we're landing as flat as possible. This is actually very nice that this little old goal post is chilling here because it's going to serve as our marker. Now, if you don't have access to, let's say, old lacrosse nets or something like that, which is totally fine. I personally don't, unless they're here at Best Yes, the best kept secret in Birmingham. You can take two poles, you can take two shovels, you can put two lawn chairs as your markers. Really, all we're trying to do is create a field goal of sorts that we can throw through. Before we think about getting the landing of the shot, we wanna make sure that we're getting that initial turning angle. So. I'm going low here, and I actually like that this is a triple mando because I can practice some going high above the pole, I can practice some going low below the pole, but I just wanna make sure that it's passing through. I'm gonna set myself off to the side here so it's not a straight shot. I'm gonna practice passing through this upright, making sure that it's coming through on Anheuser. Once again, Anheuser being that outside part of the edge, down. Now I've thrown this shot a lot, so you can see that pretty much all of these landed flat. But it's okay if when you're doing this initial practice, they're coming through and they're doing what this polecat did, and they're landing a little more extreme and you get a little bit of roll out of it. All that means is that you're finishing the shot too hard. You're focusing too much on that commitment and that ending follow through which means that you can just come a little softer. It's not a powerful shot we're trying to throw here. It's more straightforward, a little more touchy upshot. For those of you who have an ultimate Frisbee background, especially if you were a handler, this is one of the ways that I practiced when I first was doing this, is I literally, I would put my mark behind, let's say this water bottle is my mark that I had an ultimate Frisbee. I would literally stand there on the disc golf course and go, two, three, and hit the pole. I'll be the first to admit, this is not a shot that I work on very often, but can have great implications to the game as well, because most of the time when I'm in this situation, I'm throwing just a forehand through the gap. However, this flexing out motion that we're talking about is very, very helpful, and I know patent pendings are something that I struggle with a lot. So this not only helps you have a new approach game in your toolbox, Wow, that was hard to say. But also when you find yourself in the middle of the woods and you gotta hit this patent pending, scr patent pending scramble, really helpful in learning that. Okay, see, so I didn't commit, I went too fluffy there. There we go, that's better. Didn't commit. There we go, committed on both of those. Now on that turnover, especially on the backhand Anheuser shot, you're usually gonna need to give it more height. So I would practice even throwing these rather than under the crossbar. I would practice trying to keep it in above the crossbar, but between. 
because especially when you're throwing this backhand Anheuser, this works a lot better on longer distances, so it has time to really lean into it. All right, so that's the basics, is you wanna first focus on getting through on that Anheuser angle, making sure that your discs are staying committed on the Anheuser angle, and then just enough that it gets that flat landing every time, because that is the key to this shot, is seeing that flat landing. So let's talk about the discs that you can throw this shot with, which honestly, the short answer is, all of them but i think there are really three different categories of discs specifically for approaches that you're going to use this in and all three of those actually have sort of their own fit to why you would want to use them in these scenarios i'm going to start with the more neutral one and then head to the extremes and let you know along the way which is my personal favorite and which one i actually have been using way more out there on the course starting with the neutral category it's generally your choice of overstable putt and approach disc this can be an avr x3 a pig a zone an a2 a tactic oh man it's just tough because i feel like if i don't name yours you're gonna be like why did you name that? the yarn the harp yeah Got that one. I'm just like walking around our store. Um, we already said the tactics, so just maniacs are happy. Said the A2, A3 works in there as well. Um, the distortion, yeah. You just find your choice of oversale putt and approach disc. That's the disc that we're talking about before where you throw it on some hyzer and reliably wants to get left every single time. Now, traditionally, these are designed, these type of discs are designed to lean into whatever shot shape you're putting it on. They usually don't have so much stability that when you throw them on these opposite shots that they're gonna fight out that fast. But the nice thing is, is that they, because they do have a decent amount of it, they can be very helpful in learning this shot first because they're going to have that auto correction. So you're gonna to have to learn to commit a little more on the follow through to make sure that you're finishing the shot but it's gonna be a lot harder to burn these type of discs into the ground to get that rolling motion because of the extra stability they have. So for me personally, I've got a pig. I am about 60, 70 feet away from the basket, I would say. All right, I'm a liar. I'm 85 feet away from the basket. Holy cannoli, Batman, depth perception's hard. That's also why I get so mad when people are like, I missed all my 10 footers in a round. Bro, no you didn't. You missed like 20 and 25 footers, so. Another question that I'll go ahead and answer before people roast me in the comments is, yeah, there's a lot of disc dots on that basket, especially the smaller basket, but when I was in the highest part of my disc dot contract and I was doing an ad with them every month, they had custom dots for every tour member and that was my display model so that I had really cool shots of all of them because the dots were really cool and I still love them and really love what they did. Anyways, aside. So at 85 feet, this is a great example of somewhere where if I'm trying to like normally run a putt or something like that, I'm gonna have a really hard time. And I may be able to throw like my soft flick of the wrist approach, but having this shot in the bag is super helpful because now I feel like I could tackle this two ways. I could try to tackle it with just hyzers into the basket. That was short. Come on, Dennis. That was long. All right, Goldilocks. And that was terrible. The issue with the hyzer is, is that once again, if I really want to commit to throwing this in, I have to come high and let it crash in, which puts us on that extreme angle, which causes rollaway potential, terrible flare potential, things like that. So. Having another option where it's gonna land more flat actually lets me sort of run and be more aggressive and have the chance to save more holes based off of bad approaches, bad tee shots, whatever, than I may not have in the past. So we've got headwind coming at us, which with headwind coming at us, that means it's gonna be a little more touchy to throw this Anheuser angle because it's gonna make it less stable. So. Just have to be careful of that. I'm trying to go high and then paint it across the basket. So while it's flattening, coming out of that Anheuser is about where I want it to come in contact with the basket. I want it out to the right and then coming in right at the basket. And if it misses, I'm landing flat maybe 10, 15 feet behind the basket. The key to this though, is that you can give it the height to actually give it a chance to go in without being worried about being super far past the basket. Okay, so that one, great example of that's the most overstable of these pigs not committing to the shot. Okay, that was better. You see how it was flattening at the basket? Still not enough, Annie, because it kind of fought out, but that's gonna be 15 feet behind the basket. On all of these pigs, I didn't commit to the Anheuser angle enough 
on throwing it. So that's something you need to be wary of when you're throwing something that's a little more overstable. Is I mentioned before I even threw the shots, hey, this is something that like you got to commit to, you got to commit to, make sure you trust that angle. If I'm being honest with you, I know lots of people who will throw softer Anheuser approaches with their main putting approach disc. It's not really an option that I use this disc for. I have another disc in my bag that I use this for. But let's talk about option two real fast. All right, so let's say you're like me and you just went to throw your approach disc and you were like, yo, that wasn't it, my guy. I wasn't able to commit to it enough. Maybe because you're afraid of burning it into the ground too much. Now, my solution for that is that you can go to a more overstable disc, which means that you're definitely gonna have to focus on commitment because if you don't commit with a more overstable disc, then it's definitely gonna fight out and you're never gonna have a chance. But uh, these discs have become increasingly popular lately. In fact, in the last year, we've seen two really released that have been, I think cows are looking at this going like, wow, that's pretty beefy, dude. And then I have one that I've had in my bag for a long time, but I'll be honest, one of these is trying to compete with it right now to see if it pushes it out of the back. So the nice thing is these discs are a lot harder to burn into the ground, but you have to commit. And because of that, they also work really well. Let's say if you aren't a touch thrower, you don't really love throwing those touch shots. You're more of a full power player yourself. This more overstable, option could be it for you. So the three that we have here are, I have a Justice made by Dynamic Discs. I have a Saki Bomb Slammer in the premium plastic made by Dynamic Discs. And last but not least, I've got the Beef Zone OS. And you know it's beef because look at them flight numbers. Like I said, with these discs, I can give them a little more chance. I'll just show you real fast. This is me trying to throw these about just as hard as I threw the last ones. And they should show you the difference in flight. You can see Wow, that was kind of beautiful. Okay. Yeah, there's that Saki bomb. With minimal power, slower option, you can still see I'm barely giving it anything and it's getting a full flight out of the disc, which is fantastic. That allows it to be super easy. And I think that there is a reason to have discs like this in the bag for exactly that. If you find yourself often being 70, 80 feet short of the basket. This makes it so you have an easier chance. But also, I'm gonna try to give this a little more height and see if we can't be more aggressive to get it on that pan coming in. I'm gonna go Zone OS first. Beef. Slammer. See how these look like, oh my goodness, there's no chance that they're gonna fight out, but they're getting in. That's the beauty of the really overstable option. You can see even there, I gave it too much height. I gotta let it nose up. But obviously we made one on the marksman basket. I mean, making one on the marksman basket, if that doesn't deserve a like on this video, I'd... I don't know what you guys are doing. I personally have the Justice in my bag and I will tell you that the one that it's been fighting with the most is that Zone OS because shots like that continue to not be an anomaly when it comes to when I'm putting these two against each other. So watch out. Could be a rough time for you soon, Justice. My only hesitancy that I ever give with putting a disc that's this overstable is if you get focused on the chop, there's a chance that if you lean into the chop too much and you let the correction of this fight for you every time, then it's gonna be really hard to throw this shot with let's say even your regular zone or the pig or things like that. So can be tough if you go too overstable on this initial shot, which takes me to my personal favorite, which is actually the incredibly neutral, more putter type lid. I've got three culprits here. One is the glitch. I know that a lot of people love throwing. I don't have the glitch in my bag or in my hands just because as you saw in that glitch versus uh, beetle video when it's really hot outside me and the glitch don't get along so i've got the better glitch here which is the watt really loved this one you guys saw that uh that review recently of the watt versus the nova this thing blew me away i have the internet cult favorite disc the berg in here because as much as i want to trash on the berg it is actually really beautiful at this shot because it's a lack of glide and wanting to get to the ground I mean that I can be pretty aggressive running at the basket and it's just gonna drop right behind it. Or you have, in my opinion, the better Berg, which is the Polecat. 
Polecat's beautiful because it can do what the bird does and it can have other options as well. But personally, I love throwing the polecat on this option. I've got a premium plastic, a halo polecat that I use in this shot, but the DX one will work just fine as well. Now, why this one works really well is because I, you heard me mention that I don't really usually throw my pig on this flex line. And that's because I'm usually bouncing between either the justice or my polecat on this. And the reason being is because it actually being on both ends of the spectrum caused me to not focus too much on the chop while also letting these discs kind of fly. These slower, more neutral discs, this is a two speed, a one speed and a one speed. What's beautiful about these is that they don't really require a ton of pull on them. And if you find yourself struggling on that commitment angle, these work really well and they are way glidier than the more overstable options. So with these type of discs, I don't have to focus so much on pulling it down into the basket. I can kind of let it stay high and on Anheuser and it's just slowly gonna come out of that option which for these means that if I don't commit or I throw it a little softer, because I know in these situations, lots of people can be gun shy or hesitant to overpower the shot. These floaty options allow me to very casually just toss it up there and know that it's still gonna work its way over, which is phenomenal. So you can see on each of these, all of them were short. That's a lack of commitment by me. I got so excited because I kept throwing all the beefy ones past the basket that didn't give these guys a chance. But the furthest one out is this watt, and it is one, two, three, four. Like three and a quarter steps. So for the meter people, you know how easy that is. And for us non-smart meter, non-meter people, it's like 12 to 15 feet, but very repeatable because I just threw three shots in a row and they all landed right next to each other. Let's see if we can give these a little bit more of a chance and try to throw them in. But like I said, the beauty of this is that it's so little power required. Let's say I'm on a knee and I'm like stuck in the woods. It faded off, my drive faded off a little more than I wanted. And I'm like, ah, oh, this stinks, basket's way up there. Instead of having to grab that overstable disc and yank it down, I can just come in real casually right here That's metal. That's metal. It's two in a row from 80 feet that literally drew metal. One of them a foot farther and it's in, even not even a foot, a little like eight inches farther and it's in. So repeatable and notice that I didn't have to really yank down on any of those shots. They just go up and they float their way over. This shot allows you a stress-free approach to the basket so that you have the chance of the potential of throwing it in. I wanna give one more example before we wrap up the video of what this looks like a little further out. All right, so we moved the basket a little further out. It's now about 125 feet away from us. And when we get to this distance, you're gonna see, I think on those shorter touch approaches, I think that the lids or the slower options, which once again, the Polecat being my preferred disc for this shot, they struggle a little bit more because you can no longer just finesse it and let it touch in. You gotta throw a little more juice to get it there, but let's see what they can do. Fantastic. Berg's off the metal. And that one hit a tree right next to me and it's still gonna be fantastic. We'll move up to the pigs next. There you go. You can see we have to get on that a little more to make sure that it stays in it. That's our flippy pig, burned it a little too much. Okay, fantastic. Let's try last but not least, we're gonna start with the Justice. The Justice, you can see how easy it is on these overstables. Based on what we talked about with that uh, internal battle, it's very easy to juice these long because of how simple letting the disc fight itself goes. 
All right, all of our options are up there. Let's go see how they worked out. Now the Justice being the anomaly here, definitely gave it a chance, but we we're far enough out on the Justice that like we actually give a chance to like run it back in there. Our outliers were we have the pig here at 28 feet and the pig over there at about 21 feet, but everything else you can see is nice and tight on the basket, giving it a chance with the berg even bouncing off of the cage. So what are our takeaways here? There are a host of different discs that you can throw this shot with. You don't have to necessarily just throw the shot with, let's say a polecat or a berg, and you don't have to just throw the shot with a Zone OS either. Depending on what needs you have and where you are on the course at the time, having different options on being able to throw this Anheuser Flex approach, this is a valuable shot that I think more players need to lean into and not necessarily make their only option because I don't think there's any tool that's so good that it should be the only option to use on the course. But having this in your approach toolbox will help you lower your scores while you're out there on the course. I wanna give one final warning before we dive into this and that is drivers. Some of you watching may be telling me like, hey, Mr. YouTube man, what if I grab my Felon or my Firebird? Can I do the same shot with this? Well, in theory, yes, because they're more overstable. What those do bring into the equation that these lower speed discs don't are that those faster discs are a little more angle and nose sensitive. So let's say you saw several shots that I threw here that I didn't fully commit to the Anheuser angle. And if I don't do that with a nine speed, it's definitely gonna fight out and get moving faster, which is gonna put you farther away from the basket. The other thing about a nine speed is it has that bladed edge, which means when it hits the ground, it's gonna flare quite often. So not only do you have to worry about, let's say all of these came in trying to land flat, but even if they came back a little bit, even like let's say the Zone OS or the Justice, they're not a big enough nose that they're gonna get like a massive skip or anything like that. So personally, I'd recommend stopping at let's say five speeds like the Justice, the Zone OS, Socket Mom Slammer, things like that, and try to let that be your top end specifically for this shot. But for you, if you already are throwing this shot in your game, what disc do you prefer to lean into? And if you've not thrown the shot, which of these looks the most interesting to you while you're out there? In the meantime, I want to say thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Please make it fantastic for someone else too. And I hope that this shot really is as much of a game changer for you as it is for me. I want to say thank you for watching. But for now, we're going to leave you with the birdie.